Have you ever handled a historic item that completely changed the way you thought of that period? Have you ever studied a complex research problem where you couldn't find the detailed information you needed from the history books available? Stay with us for that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of The Evolving Warfighter. Good day, my name is Dr. Franklin Annis, and today we're going to talk about the use of archives. And specifically to demonstrate this video, we're going to go to my favorite museum, the National World War I Museum at Liberty Memorial. Today we're lucky enough to get Jonathan Casey, the director and archivist at the Edward Jones Research Center, to give us an interview about using this remarkable resource. Come in, you see the main gallery, read what they have, kind of once you've been through it, you've learned everything you can from the museum, but there's quite a bit more kind of learning opportunities that you somewhat touched on here, but could you tell us outside of the exhibit space what are some of the other activities the museum are doing? To... Uh, well, the, a big component is uh, social media, so we just take it into the digital realm, um, and that's that's a daily thing that we're um, we're always trying to get people engaged in World War One, the World War One period, and obviously we're in the centennial, so that's that's a that's help. I mean, that's kind of focuses things, so it helps in that way. But I think a lot of, uh, besides the centennial, just a lot of people have an interest in this period of time, and and uh, in the in what the National World War One Museum is, and and uh, so social media is a big thing, a, a daily thing that's uh, of promoting what we're doing, whether programs or exhibitions, um, and just kind of promoting the idea of the, of a hundred years ago what was going on, and then how we can compare it to today. So there's all that going on. Um, we do a lot of fundraising for uh, a number of things, and we just had a recently our annual fundraising gala. And so we're 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 always bringing in the community as much as possible. You know, I, I, I started the story by saying the civic and business leaders who got organized and then organized the people uh, for this whole thing to create uh, the Liberty Memorial. But that's what we've been engaging the last few years. Um, the civic and business leaders, the, especially the arts uh, community, the arts various arts organizations here in Kansas City, like Nelson Atkins, obviously being a big, big one, but uh, the um, Kansas City Symphony and the ballet. I mean, everybody, all the different arts, fine arts, performing arts, just to get them into um, and uh, the, thinking about the World War One period, and they've done their productions of whatever it is connects to World War One, and so that was a big thing to, to tie all that in. And, and that makes us more of a player in the city and a player as, a, as an attraction. Um, so I say it's it, as a cultural institution and educational institution and uh, more than just a, the idea of more than just a museum and a research center, but just kind of what the meaning of, of, of we are, what our significance of, of what we are to the Kansas City community. And then, and then beyond that, of course, to the country and the, and the uh, world. Um, and I don't. I didn't say before, but we were, you know, originally called the Liberty Memorial for years, and that's that's what you would know it as if you grew up in Kansas City or were familiar with it. And I'm not from here, uh, so if I can just uh, say sort of anecdotally, I'm not from here. So I came. I, I had never heard of it before, but that's not surprising when I found out the story. There was really no marketing done or anything, and I've always been interested in military history, and um, and my uh, my maternal grandfather served in the war, so I knew something about World War One and all. But um, I hadn't heard of it, and, and um, but there's a lot of museums and things that I've heard of. But I got here and I thought, well, this is a big structure and this 217 foot tower and all this stuff. It's like it seems like um, it's just there, but no one knows what it is and kind of thing. So that was that was a, kind of how it was, you know, over those years. And um, and like I said, I mentioned we really changed that around. And one of the things we became that, that did change, we became the national um, the national museum in. Uh, I have this right. I think 2004, if I have the date right, it's in 2004, I believe. Which I think so. We had we got the designation from Congress. It was a def, it was part of a defense authorization bill from Congress, and then we became a national historic landmark, which is a special designation from the Park Service, which is a a, a prestigious designation. There aren't a lot of these NL uh, NHLs, national historic landmarks. There's national historic other things. A lot all over the country, but there's not that many. There's only one or two other in the metro in the Kansas City metro area. So that was a big deal. I think that was in '06. So that was to have that designation, and we have a plaque on that's outside on the front. If you walk in, hopefully some people notice it anyway, because it's an important thing. And then uh, we became the National Memorial in 2015. Um, there was um, 
uh, authorization for that, uh, and then and of course then we we are part of the National Centennial Commission and all that. So that that's also part of the outreach nationwide and everything, and with the commission and our president and CEO is on the commission. So that's all part of it. But so there's a lot of components, you know. So for the what I think outreach um, and the and so other than just the traditional exhibitions and even the traditional programs that go with those, there's all this others. All these, all these other things that are going on. So. so I'm sure you have a broad range of researchers come in. I know that I asked to see some uh, some materials on the 110th sanitary train. Uh, can you tell me kind of the scope of what type of people access your your archives and research center and what projects you're yeah. working on? Um, that's scope is pretty broad. It's um, uh, from all over. It could be academics working on a book. Uh, you know, doing their research for something like that, or it could be um, um, not non-academics, like working on a project of, of anything, um, uh, uh, like a, a book or something, um, trying to think, or a play or something like that. So there's kind of a mix, um, and uh, we have our, our researchers. Um, we do have, in terms of a general answer to that question, we don't have so many on-site researchers going like using the collection so much in depth it's more people who are contacting us every day for one reason or another a lot asking questions of all kinds and these these are these are people who are could be a grade school middle school on up through high school and into college just asking for various school projects national history day projects and all so we have a lot of contacts uh, that i call that uh, we do a monthly report on on these things and we have a uh, and people who who uh, don't come here, but need to find out about something about World War One, or you know, have an interest in World War One, and and um, and uh, want to make a connection somehow with what we have. And so we got a we got a lot of contacts that we got a lot of um, interaction that way with people. Now and and uh, but on site here we again people um, again it's it's a, a a mix of things of what they're looking at in the collection. Mostly it's going to be archival. It's going to be two dimensional. They can, uh, they go through, the people who do come here go through a vetting process where they say, yeah, I do want to see something in your collection. And that's uh, been helped in the last so many years that we have some of the collection online. We have our, um, our library holdings are for the most part, we have about 10,000 titles. They're on our, online on our website, on what we call our online collections database. And you can see what we have in the library and then you can see what we have, sort of mostly photographs. I think there were 30,000 photographs, something like that, that are digitized, that are on that database. So people can get a good idea of what we have in our photographs collection. Um, and there are some materials on there, some other materials, like some collections of letters and some other, some a mix of all kinds of things um, that are on there. But not, not so much now, we're working on that. We are, we are, um, just recently, we have someone hired as a processing archivist who's working on this backlog. We have a very uh, large backlog going back, uh, going back for more than 10 years, I think. Backlog of all kinds of things. So we're working on that. The the goal is to digitize everything. So that helps. That's the that's the entry point for uh, researchers to obviously to understand what we have in the collection. I mean, they're I'm sure researchers are kind of going out to whatever he or she can find on the internet and see who's got who's got what, you know, I'm looking for a specific thing, but um, that's the first way of kind of understanding what we have. And then um, they'll say, yeah, you know, I'd like to come in and do some research. Most of it is with the two-dimensional, but they can also do research with three-dimensional, uh, with the uniforms and the equipment and things, if, if they want to do that. So that's available as well. Just you get a lot more for doing the archive because people are looking at, they're thinking documents and they're thinking, you know, do you have any letters on this thing in the wars when somebody served in a particular place or in a particular unit? And now I want to look at that. And then, um, uh, but it's all it's all theoretically open to any, anyone, a vetted researcher who's, um, and I say vetted, and we're that's that's the word, but it's not like a, uh, I think it's kind of we're welcoming to anyone, you know, anyone that's, uh, but we just want to know sort of what we need to know what the person wants to do so we can try to help the person. And that's the first thing I always say, we, you know, we'll, try, we'll help you the, as much as we can, you know, and, and, we, and we may not have something. If we don't have something you're looking for, um, we can probably give suggestions as to where to maybe find it, you know, some other repository out there, because we're, we're familiar with a lot of places and we work with a lot of places. 
So that's helpful to people um, doing that. So you kind of touched on it, but do you have any recommendations? So if someone's interested in studying a specific topic or person, um, how's the best way to interact with the staff down here or let you know? You know? Yeah, the best, if somebody's interested in some, I mean, the best way is to contact me um, and I, it's best to do by email always and people call me and all and I do answer my phone calls but I'm not in my office a lot so it's kind of I get to them eventually but um, email is the quickest thing obviously and email me the archivist or, or Doran Cart the senior curator we're the two who are responsible for the whole collection and we've kind of divided it up into two dimensional three dimensional and um, you know just contact us and just say what you want what it is you're looking for you know just ask the questions and like I said we do sometimes we got a a list and these are tend to be sort of people like younger maybe um, like I said middle school high school students who do national student day projects so and they'll send a whole list of things and because the, they've got an assignment and so that usually those go to the research center attendance I just I don't get involved in that so much I mean I may comment on it but I the, the attendants do a really good job answering that kind of stuff so um, we get as I said, a lot of contacts a month there's a um, um, you know, and, and something could be, it could take a couple hours to research, something could be off the top of our heads, you know, just like, we know that. And then, uh, so we have that, and uh, that, that's the best way. Contact us by email, uh, and it's on our website, you know. Well, I know you traveled the world looking at uh, different uh, artifacts to bring back to the museum, or you've seen yeah. the whole entire collection at the yeah. museum. Uh, what's, do you have a particular favorite item, or an item that you it's think a, is most interesting? Yeah, that's a that's a kind of hard question. We have a large collection, and we're we're saying two hundred thousand objects, and that's I think every letter and photograph and everything. There, I, we have a great poster collection. It's it's um, over a thousand posters, or roughly that. There's we have a few hundred duplicates of those, but in terms of numbers, I think it's around a thousand. So it's not a huge thing, but it's it's extensive. And countries, it represents pretty much all the countries in the war. There are some of the posters I really like out of all those. There's there's a, a few of them that really I find very interesting. And posters are, are great objects to uh, to do anything with, to teach with, or even to do a program with, because right? there's so much to a poster that you can talk about. So there's from from my point of view as an archivist, um, uh, from knowing from uh, knowing the archives collection, that's that's the first thing that comes to mind. Um, there's some things on exhibit that are really significant pieces on, on exhibit like the like our tank our French FT-17 Renault tank or something so you know some of the bigger things they're impressive because they're big and and they're just there's a whole long story to that tank and and um, stories are, are interesting to me stories behind objects almost sometimes more interesting than the object itself is you know the, the life of the thing and how it came to how it got here and so forth and who had it before us and all that kind of thing so that's interesting um, and so there's there's a um, there are some things on exhibit, you know, like that, that I could probably think of that are that are really interesting. It's it's sort of a hard question to answer because there's so much stuff, and I see so much stuff material that comes in, you know, like almost on a we get approached almost on a daily basis about a potential donation. We don't take everything. That's I think that's important to say. We don't take everything because we just can't do that. We wouldn't do that as a trying to manage a collection. That's not you know that's you you don't do that if you're managing the collection. You, you just say well we have examples of this and we do try to give advice as to where that person can donate it so you know and sometimes we don't know sometimes it's just like well then I don't know where you could send that but um, we that's we just have to manage it and um, the collection there's about we always say about eight percent that's on exhibits and it's not all ours like I said some of the exhibitions here are, are traveling some are from other museums and all and then um, so it's not all our material that is using up our spaces you know, and um, again, back to it's it's a it's a good question, and I, I you know for me I think it's a, some some of the posters that I really like, um, and um, there are probably some things that uh, like individual letters or something, just what the information contained in the letters. There's well, there's a good collection of letters, and I wish I had a really good photograph of this person who created, it, but he was a a dentist, which. Um, um, YMCA dentist. He served with the YMCA in Siberia, and he was um, he's got this a collection of letters, about 50 letters to his wife and daughter, and they were in I think China at the time. So he was sort of doing missionary work, but he was a dentist from Chicago, and had come over to serve. And he was 
he was involved in the middle of all the politics going on. This was the summer winter of 1918, summer fall winter, and then kind of into 1919. And he was on a train and had been going all through, starting in uh, Manchuria and then going all the way into the uh, really the interior of Russia. I mean, way in to it. And uh, um, you can imagine if you understand what's going on with the civil war between the Reds and the Whites and all the back and forth. So I was thinking like Dr. Zhivago because of the train and everything. He's on this train and he had his, he was on it because he had his practice, his uh, his uh, surgery or whatever you want to call it, his dental office was there on the train and he had a sleeping car and everything and it was all uh, modern, as modern as possible because they, they needed dental. <laughs> they needed a dentist. And he was, he was treating, it wasn't Americans, many of them, because I think they had decent care. It was Everybody else was in there. The people there was a mix. There was an uh, international allied intervention in Russia and Siberia, as there was in North Russia. But at the time, and there were all these Czech soldiers who had been prisoners of the Russians who were trying to get out of Russia. And they formed what's called the Czech Legion, and that. And they were. He was operating on them and pulling teeth. You know, and he tells how many teeth he pulled and all this. I mean, it's so. I don't. It's you know, the war is everything. The war takes everything, and a war of that size is anything you can imagine that people do is going to be done in the war. And um, yeah, he just relates all the, this information and this how the brutal the winters are and the snow drifts and the and that's what I mean by like Chicago, just the look of it and um, you know the Bolsheviki he calls them. I mean they would attack the train and they'd have to fight them off and you know so that's that's a neat set of letters uh, and he's got he doesn't have a, we have a photograph of him but it's not very good it's odd because we have a bunch of other photos that came with the letters that are just of of Vladivostok and that eastern part of, of Russia and and uh, sort of the train and the you know and the people and you see all the different uniforms and everything because all this there like I said is international uh, effort and, uh, um, and so that's that's an interesting that's kind yeah, of interesting collection one of the letters was actually typed on birch bark I mean literal oh. literal tree bark birch tree you think all the birches in Russia and it's that thin and he typed it on there and said oh yeah this is on a piece of birch bark you know and we we made some copies of it, but we have the original birch bar. Wow. The letter. So it's actually typed on there. And he sent in his, you know, he was sending it to his wife and just always talking about how much he misses her and loves her and, you know, all the, what you would think and romantic kind of thing. And um, um, that's a neat collection. And the only other one, then I'll sit with two dimensional. We have envelopes. I was talking to somebody yesterday about these uh, envelopes that are illustrated, that are color illustrated, and they're done really well. So they're really artwork. Uh, father to son, and the father had been a scene, uh, scenery painter for vaudeville shows oh, you know, before okay. the war. So he had experience, he had um, and talent for it. So he's he's uh, the son was in the air um, in the Signal Corps air uh, air section of the Signal Corps, and uh, he was in the balloon or the, yeah the balloon section I think specifically. So he was trained down in Texas and then went over to France and. He sent a letter and the letters and they were all, you know, the envelopes are illustrated and, and the son, we have all that, there's correspondence with it, there are, uh, within the correspondence, the son, um, he had his own drawings, kind of black and white sketches that the son did. Anyway, we have about 50 of these envelopes and apparently there were a lot more, but they were, they got stolen or they okay. disappeared somewhat. And so it's, it's um, to have these, because apparently these were, um, these were gone for about 50 years, the family lost track of them and then they found them again and they donated them. And, and they sent me the images, you know, they sent me an email, and I thought they would, they were so good looking, I thought they wanted to sell them, like, because something with this artwork, I thought they would think it's got some value in it, but they said, no, I just want to donate it. And there's a whole story to it that they had a book published, and we sold it in the store for a while, and I think till we ran out of the books, and then um, there's, there's a, it's, it's a, again, it's this whole background to it that's really interesting. I'd like to thank Jonathan Casey for taking the time for this interview. I'd also like to thank him and the rest of the staff at the National World War I Museum and Memorial for preserving and presenting the artifacts for this critical period in world history. I encourage all my viewers to go visit this fine institution. If you enjoyed this video and wish to see future videos on military self-development, I encourage you to subscribe to The Evolving Warfighter. I'll leave you with three additional resources for studying the history of the First World War. The first being the Great War Channel. This channel provides a week-by-week -week view of the complexities of the First World War. The second source I have for you is more information on a Renault FT-17 tank similar to the one displayed in this museum, made by the Tank Museum in Bobbington. Finally, I encourage you to take a look at the museum's YouTube page, where they host all their symposia that take a very detailed look at the topics and events of the First World War.